we'll, we'll start. Okay, can I introduce you all to Robbie McPherson? Um, he's a schools and youth uh, outreach officer at UK charity uh, Hope for the Future. Um, he's actually currently studying politics and sociology at the University of Sheffield and is a member of the Teach the Future Campaigners Advisory Board. Um, in terms of Hope for the Future, that is a charity um, that works across the UK, empowering communities, individuals, and campaigners with the skills and knowledge needed to um, effectively engage their local and national politicians in taking long lasting and meaningful climate action. So I hope we're gonna have quite an active um, workshop, Robbie, with you, and, and you're gonna be able to give some of the some of the tools that we need to make ourselves more active in this area. So handing over to you. Great, thank you so thank much you. for that introduction. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for inviting me today to speak um, and allowing me to talk a little bit more about the work that we get up to um, in the future. So yeah, I'm Robbie um, and I currently lead Schools and Youth Outreach um, at Hope for the Future. And essentially what that means is that I support the work that we do as a charity um, with young people and teachers um, across the UK and essentially encouraging them um, and supporting them in working with their local and national politicians um, to, to take the types of climate action that we really need to see um, to meet net zero um, and ensure that a just transition happens. Um, so today's session then, some of the things and some of the topics that we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to be looking a little bit more about hope for the future, who we are as a charity and what we do, um, our history and what we're up to at the minute, um, our work with young people and why we think it's important to work with young people, um, sort of climate politics um, in a UK context um, and engaging with MPs and um, the relationship based approach, which is an approach to climate lobbying and communications, which we at Hope for the Future um, created, which is sort of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach, including politics, psychology, um, environmental studies, lots of different things in there. Um, we're going to be looking at some of the case studies um, that we've that we've created um, with with the with the approach to lobbying um, that we utilize. Um, and then we're going to round up with some of the things that we can do today, um, 7th of January, um, and get involved in some climate action. So before we move on then to the contents of today's session, um, I would highly um, encourage you all to keep the conversation going um, that we're having in this um, session today. Um, so if there's a chat box enabled, then please do introduce yourselves. Please do prepare questions um, for the end. I will allow time for questions at the end. Um, and then also do give us a follow on social media so you can see our handles there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, and use the hashtag. I think the hashtag that's being used today is hashtag PGCE Green. Um, so if you stick that in any tweets, any social media posts that you do, um, then we'll be able to ensure that the conversation um, continues beyond the space that we're in right now. Sweet. So hope for the future. Who are we as a charity? Um, so essentially, we're a charity, um, like the introduction said, that works to empower communities, individuals and campaign groups um, and really working to support them um, in encouraging their local and national politicians to take climate action and place um, climate action at the heart of the political agenda. And essentially, um, you know, in the UK, we have quite a big problem whereby we have lots of climate targets, um, which I'll go into in a little while. Um, but what we don't really have is the political will. Um, from cross-party members. Uh, we, don't have, we don't really have a, um, a working climate majority, if you will, um, in the House of Commons. And so it's really important that pressure from the public um, is constant and um, pressure from the public um, happens so that our decision makers know that this is a priority um, in terms of the, you know, the public want climate action um, to happen. Um, and so, yeah, we've developed then a unique approach to lobbying, um, which is all to do with the relationship-based approach. Um, and this now has a growing and proven track record of leading to climate action being taken both within um, and outside the UK Parliament. So climate action um, and the work that we're involved with has happened um, at all levels of government um, and working with multiple other institutions as well. So in a nutshell, then, it can be said that Hope for the Future is a charity that helps create positive changes um, that benefit both people and planet. But just to give a little bit more context as to who we were, um, so basically Hope for the Future began in 2013 um, as a sort of small Yorkshire-based campaign, um, and this was in the lead up to the 2015 general election. Um, and we as an organisation, you know, we were really founded um, only in 2017 as the charity that we operate as today. 
um, and it sort of aimed initially to mobilize churchgoers um, and engage them with climate change, make their views known to parliamentary candidates um, in the general election. Um, but then, you know, we've realized that this is really important, this ongoing engagement between citizen um, and democratic representative, um, and that this, you know, needs to continue. Um, and then that's where um, the modern hope for the future basically came into being. And we realized actually um, also during this time is that we were producing quite niche, quite great resources, um, not to sort of um, blow, our, blow our own smoke a bit too much. Um, but what, what our resources were doing really mobilizing people um, and it was really leading to um, the, the, the people that might not necessarily have had the views or had the stances that we would have previously wanted them to have um, to adopt those adopt those um, more progressive, more friendly, um, environmentally friendly um, views and stances. Um, and so many campaigners then um, reported to us um, during the creation of Hope for the Future and still now actually, um, that during the meetings that they have with their um, decision makers, meaning their elected representatives, politicians, um, often these meetings have broken down um, and resulted in frustration on both sides, both by the campaigners, both by the politician, a lack of understanding between each other, an inability to find common ground, which again is a reason why um, the relationship-based approach was created. Um, and so, yeah, since, since 2013 then, we've expanded into the charity that we are today, uh, which looks a little bit more colorful, a little bit more like this. Um, so you can see some of the projects that we're involved in um, working across um, society sectors, working with young people in schools. Um, so recently, back in December, we did a workshop in Manchester, actually, um, with the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner, um, talking all things green recovery um, in Ashton, green jobs there. Um, we work with um, local constituents um, to support them in engaging uh, with their local councils, which is a programme that's run called Authority to Act. So taking the idea and the declaration of a climate emergency and putting that into tangible um, climate action plans. Um, we, we're always creating resources um, and strategies for individuals campaigners and community groups again, and um, various policy resources. So you can see there an example, um, Heat in Our Homes. Um, again, supporting teachers. Um, so we're actually, um, it was meant to run um, back in December, um, an event called the Big Climate Teaching, which was all about um, giving teachers essentially um, the platform to really speak to MPs um, on a level about climate education and what needs to happen and be done um, in schools. Um, and then we also work with faith groups um, to, Across, across projects, similar projects to schools. Um, and there's a lot of emphasis at the minute um, working with the faith communities um, in the run up to COP26. So yeah, that's hope for the future today. And um, we're a very lively and um, lively and large organization. We've currently got offices um, in Sheffield, uh, Liverpool and London um, and a staff team of nearly up to 20 um, full-time members of staff now. So we are growing. Um, and just to give you a few bits of um, information on the types of impact that we had last year, um, over a thousand and or the 1,115 people um, went through our training. This consisted of over 100 hours of training. I'm sure many of you will be familiar that you know through the kickoff of Zoom, everybody was online all the time, uh, doing lots of types, um, different types of webinars and that sort of thing. Uh, we produced 106 tailored strategies, um, 93 MP engagements, and facilitated 37 MP meetings. Um, and I had the luxury um, of facilitating 11 school workshops um, in the last in the last year. So that's the kind of impact that we're having as a charity in terms of um, the, the types of people and numbers of people that we're supporting. Um, and I feel like that gives a good roundup to move on to the next section of the workshop. Um, and so that is um, our work with young people and really why we're here today. Um, and so Essentially, at Hope for the Future, what our approach to lobbying involves um, is sort of a cross-society approach in that we believe that it's broad coalitions of people and that it's really going to lead to the impact um, that we need to have. In that, you know, we need to have faith communities um, talking to members of parliament. We need to have young people talking to members of parliament. We need to have um, um, young and old people um, talking to members of parliament. We need to have working class people talking to members of parliament, middle class, et cetera. We need a cross society approach um, to really get the change that we need. And that's why we believe that young people who have been and are a key demographic um, in the fight against um, ecological breakdown and um, why we believe it's so important to uplift their voice. 
Um, and we've seen, you know, the impacts um, in this country. Um, I think Teach the Future involved today. I sat on their advisory board. Um, they've had great impacts um, in lobbying for climate education. Um, so it's really important to continue to, to uplift um, the voices of young people and support them um, in their efforts of lobbying decision makers. And so the way that we do that at Hope for the Future and the way that this is relevant um, to you guys as teachers um, is that we provide sc um, free school workshops, um, which include um, a visit um, and an opportunity for teachers and young people, students alike to lobby their MP um, on climate change, which are free of charge. So if you're someone that's doing a PGC, working in a school, get on workshops, that is a brilliant, brilliant way to really engage your MP um, in the types of content that you will have learned about today, the types of things that um, you probably already think in terms of what, what do we need to do um, to, to really prevent this from getting worse? Um, how can we make it better now? Do a Hope for the Future School workshop. It will empower your students, it'll empower you, um, and it will give you the opportunity to meet your politicians um, in live time um, and really put your, put your points um, and thoughts and ideas across to them. Um, and then the other ways um, that we're also supporting young people is through My Hope for the Future art competition, um, which essentially is an art competition which um, um, tasks students um, to create various different images about what a net zero a carbon neutral climate friendly future could look like. Um, and then the hope is that then we display that um, to politicians and provide sort of evidence like this is the imagination, this is the um, ideas that young people have. It's up to you guys um, to make this a reality. Let's work together um, to do that. And then the final um, project is making climate politics easier. This is something um, that I'm very proud of. Um, so when I got involved in Hope for the Future um, as a placement student, um, this is one of the things that I worked on and it's all about making climate politics easier for people to understand and work with. It's all about making it accessible and ensuring that um, the, the types of groups um, that aren't traditionally involved um, in the climate movement. So thinking um, about the types of inclusivity and diversity problems um, that activist space have, um, those types of people can be involved. Um, and one of the things that um, was really important to me when I was creating this program is that people could do it in their own time. Um, so specifically targeted um, young people um, and students who you know, are very involved um, in precarious employment. Um, their schedules are very um, inflexible sometimes. And um, so it's really important that people can get involved in climate activism and um, to a timetable that really suits them. So that's a little bit more about our work with young people. Um, sorry for the quite long introduction and ramble, um, but it's always good to really um, ensure that you guys all understand the work that we're doing um, and a bit more about us as an organisation. So let's move on then um, to climate politics um, in the UK. Um, so two of the things that we're just going to quickly go over, which I think is important to understand, um, you might already know about this, great if you do, if you don't, then you're about to find out. Um, so the first one is um, essentially the Climate Change Act in 2008. Um, so in 2008, the Labour government at the time um, became, we became um, the UK first country in the world to set legally binding um, climate reduction targets. So what the Climate Change Act of 2008 basically established um, was that we were going to reduce our emissions by 80% compared to 99 levels by 2050, um, and that this was going to be done um, across multiple sectors. Um, and what the Act also re um, did, which is really relevant um, to the work that needs to be done today, um, is that it set carbon budgets um, and also established um, the Committee on Climate Change to advise on these um, budgets. So essentially carbon budgets, um, sorry for all the lingo, um, are basically budgets which are set every five years to outline how much um, carbon the UK can output, how much carbon we can emit. Um, and basically it provides a short term time scale a um, short term frame um, for the UK um, to successfully reduce their long term carbon emission plans. So just to give some more context on the carbon budgets, um, currently we are on track to meet the first three, I believe, um, but the latter two, um, we are not on track to meet, um, which means that these long term targets um, aren't going to be met if we can't meet our short term targets, which is so important. Um, that pressure is put on the government now um, and that they know that public um, that the public really wants climate action to be a priority. Um, and just building on um, the Climate Change Act then, in 2019, um, the Tory government, Conservative government rather, um, set, um, made an amendment to the 2008 Climate Change Act by ratifying the Paris Agreement, which was a big international agreement um, that happened in Paris. And basically what that agreement did um, 
was uh, that each country had to reduce um, their carbon emissions by X amount. Um, and this was to meet a global target um, of ensuring that um, global heating doesn't go beyond two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, and that our that, um, emissions, um, sorry, um, global temperature increases um, are hopefully kept to 1.5 degrees. So in 2019 then, Theresa May's government um, basically passed what's called um, as the Net Zero Act, um, and it was amendment, not an act rather, to the Climate Change Act, uh, which basically meant that the UK was going to completely get rid of our carbon emissions by 100%. But as I mentioned earlier, we are not on track to meet this target. So that creates a really, really big problem. Um, and that creates a problem in that we know how serious the climate emergency is. We know about the impacts that it has on um, people disproportionately, um, the most vulnerable and disadvantaged, both at home in the UK, um, and beyond our own borders, um, and we know that the devastating impacts that it has on nature and the planet as well. So if this doesn't give you something to worry about in terms of the government really need to do something and we need to ensure that the government are doing something, um, then yeah, I'm not sure what will. But yeah, that's, that's why we need to essentially put pressure on the government because they're not on track to meet their own targets. And it's all about ensuring that they are. So I'm sure that many of you have heard about members of parliament, uh, but if not, it's pretty central to the work that we do in that we um, lobby politicians. So let me introduce you to them. So essentially, we have 650 members of parliament in the UK. Um, each person has a member of parliament. Um, so these 650 MPs, each collectively or individually rather, represent what's called their constituency. So for example, um, where I'm from, I'm from Preston, um, and my constituency there is called the Ribble Valley. Um, in Sheffield, where I'm at uni, where I am right now, um, my constituency here is called Sheffield Central, and each of them constituencies is represented um, by a different member of parliament. And so basically, um, actually, sorry, I just got this slide. Um, members of Parliament then are elected typically every five years um, by the people um, to represent them in what's called the House of Commons, which I'm sure many of you are it's pretty hard not to have seen on the TV over the last few years with everything that's been going on. Um, but this room, this house um, with the green benches um, there. Um, and so MPs then, um, once elected, what do they do? Um, well, like um, the introduction said, I was basically, uh, I'm basically I'm a politics and sociology student um, and I did politics at A-level before that. So the way that I remember um, the role of an MP and the way that I always tell young people that I'm working with um, to remember the role of an MP is the three C's, which is constituency, colleagues and country. Um, so the primary objective and um, their primary role of members of parliament is to really um, represent their constituents, the people that elected them um, and put their views, their ideas, their priorities at the forefront of um, their own agenda and um, to represent their colleagues in that each member of parliament, uh, apart from a few independents that typically lurk up, um, are represented and are elected on a platform and a manifesto um, with other members of parliament um, who share similar ideas. So thinking about political parties, the Labour Party and um, the Conservative Party, um, they represent each other. So colleagues, is, so for example, um, if you're a Labour Party MP, you will represent the Labour Party's values, the Labour Party's ideas typically. Um, and if you're a Conservative MP, then you will represent um, other Conservative values, ideas, etc. Same for Greens, same for Lib Dems, same for the SNP by Cymru. Um, hopefully I've not missed out DUP and um, any other parties in the Commons. And then the final one um, is the country. So Parliament um, on the whole makes um, legislation, creates laws um, that are to benefit hopefully, um, the majority of the people. Um, and so that is like their third function to represent the UK um, and, you know, act as national um, legislature, national government, that sort of thing. So colleague, um, so constituents, colleagues and country um, is the, the, the three main roles of an MP, um, essentially. And I will also just note um, that on MPs, um, just when they're in parliament some of the more specific things that they can do um, and get involved in is that um the government um is obviously um something that mps can go on to get involved in um, and so the largest number um so the party political party with the largest number of seats in the house of commons goes on to form the government which at the moment is a conservative government um, and the second largest 
um, number of um, seats that a party has um, will go on to form the opposition, which is currently the Labour Party. Um, and then depending on whether they're on the opposition, so whether on the Labour side or whether on the Conservative side, will depend um, what um, what your MP can really do um, and what you can ask them to do. And that will become more clear um, in the next few slides as we begin to think about the types of things that we can ask our MPs um, and that sort of thing. Um, and so just to give a little bit more detail, um, con um, MPs can do lots of different things. Um, such as join select committees, get involved in what's called all, poly, all party parliamentary groups um, and select committees basically um, are designed and set up to scrutinise different government departments. So thinking about climate change, um, business, energy, industrial strategy, um, DEFRA, Department of um, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs for education, for example. Um, there's a select committee on education and these select committees contain um, members of parliament who scrutinise the government, hold them to account. Um, and that sort of thing. So that's some of the types of things that MPs can also get up to. Um, but let's think about what you can ask your MP then. So given um, that we know climate change is a problem, given that we know um, the government isn't on track to meet its own self-set targets, given the frustration that I'm sure many of you um, all have on this call, given everything that you've um, sort of learned about this morning or already know, um, and knowing that your MPs are there to elect and um, are elected to represent their constituents, um, which you will all have one, um, and knowing that they're there to represent different political parties, you might be a member of one, and given that they might, um, that they are also elected to represent the needs of the country, we all um, live in the UK. Um, so what can we ask our members of parliament to do? Um, and while there is actually a really quite broad set of things that you can ask your MP to do, um, so these include things like written questions, writing to ministers, engaging with local authorities, um, engaging with the media and holding an event, um, inviting them to a hope for the future school workshop, to name a few more things. Um, and each of these have their own benefits, which I'll go on to discuss. Um, but essentially written questions um, is really useful um, and can be used to gain um, knowledge, evidence, um, and really um, help you to get... To, to get data, for example, that you, that you might not otherwise have access to. Um, writing to ministers just involves you getting your MP or asking your MP to write a, um, a letter to a minister on behalf of you, or you writing the letter yourself and passing that on to the minister. Um, engaging with local authorities. Um, so thinking about asking your MPs to work with the local council if there's a particular um, thing going on in your area. So I know that, for example, Leeds, as a climate commission, um, and it's all about getting the city to net zero. So asking, for example, maybe Hillary Benn to work with Leeds City Council to get that done. Um, engaging with the local media, so asking them to write a local piece, um, a local media piece, an article about a local issue concerning the environment, um, or even attending an event that you yourself want to put on, um, you yourself um, have organised, or an event that you know is happening that you think that they would be a good fit um, to speak at. So these are the types of things that you can ask your MP. Um, and I will say this early on that when you do meet your MP, if you meet your MP, um, if you ever um, go on to do that, what's really important is that you know what you want to ask them um, and the ask is really focused and that'll become more clear again later um, in the session. So let's consider then some of the impacts that these um, asks can have. Um, well, the first couple, so um, writing written questions, um, and writing to ministers and um, people might be like oh I didn't even know what that was I don't still don't really know what that was um, essentially um, basically what the big benefits of them are is that it really lets the government know what what matters to the people so when members of parliament um, and we, we get this the privilege of knowing all of this because we work with MPs every single week and um, is that when members of parliament um, are making their sort of um, case for what they're going to do um, during their time in office um, and deciding what's important to them. A lot of that, and this is backed up by academic research, is determined by the correspondence that they receive from their constituents. And equally, um, when the government decides what their priorities are, um, that is a, there's a lot of factors in that. But one of the big factors um, is the pressure that they receive from members of parliament. So if you can encourage your a member of parliament to talk about climate change, write to ministers about climate change, submit written questions on climate change, um, specifically um, 
like specific issues that matter to you, whether that's green jobs, green transport, a greener curriculum, um, air pollution, and um, them sorts of things, then the government will know that, right, my MPs are receiving this correspondence from their, cons my, their constituents. This is an issue that really matters. So when these government departments, when these ministers um, are sort of determining what their priorities and agendas are going to be, um, that can help to inform that, especially um, if what you're asking your MP to write to the Minister about is something that you can demonstrate um, sort of has widespread support um, and there's lots of action um, which, which can follow that um, in terms of like plans and things like that. Um, it can build support. So there's a big problem, again, backed up by academic research, um, that not a lot of MPs um, feel that there's widespread support um, for climate action to be taken, and that's why they've avoided acting on it. Um, and we'll go into detail about that again later on. Um, and so by holding things like events, by getting your MP to write in the local media, by engaging with local authorities, all of these things are ways to build widespread support and show to your MP um, that, um, that climate action is something that is um, a priority for people and something that people really care about. Um, and then, like I said, getting information um, with written questions um, and writing to ministers. Um, and then combining local and national climate action is something that is really, really, really important. Um, and basically, um, a great example of this um, is that recently an organisation called UK 100 um, collectively signed, um, I think it was 40 local authorities came together to renew their pledges to meet net zero um, and basically said that they were going to meet net zero earlier than national government. Um, and so by combining local and national climate action, what you can then um, see happen is that national government becomes much more ambitious um, and that local government is actually able um, to fulfil their climate commitments due to the fact that they'll hopefully then get the powers and budgets spending that sort of thing that they really need to make their promises um, a reality. So these are the, old, the, the types of impacts um, on a sort of circus value that um, these things can have. Um, and it's really important that um, you realise that, you know, these things might seem minimal. So you might be thinking, right, what is a letter going to realistically do? But like I said, that letter is going to demonstrate um, to the government that this thing is something that people care about. Um, and the more the more widespread you make that, the more people you can get on board, then the bigger the impact that's going to have. Um, and if anyone's got any more questions about these, then please do ask me at the end um, and we can talk a bit more about that. Um, but just to go into um, sort of the academic um, founding um, of some of the things that I've just discussed. So you might be familiar um, with um, the lady that's on the screen, Professor Rebecca Willis, um, who recently published a book called Too Hot to Handle, The Democratic Challenge of Climate Change. Um, and so Rebecca Willis um, was the former director of Green Alliance. Um, she's been a researcher for a number of years and is currently professor at Lancaster University. Um, and Rebecca basically um, conducted a number of interviews with uh, members of parliament from across the political aisle um, to determine what it is that prevents them from acting on climate change, what it is that scares them, um, why they communicate climate change in particular ways, um, and to answer a number of other questions. And I would really, really recommend reading some of Rebecca's articles um, on the book that's on the screen. Um, but basically to give you um, a quick summary of Rebecca's work um, and a bit of a basis to hopefully inspire you um, to want to do more and show you why it's important that you um, on this call do do something um, about the climate emergency in terms of getting involved um, in politics and more specifically um, working with your MP. Um, so Rebecca basically found that MPs, um, they do on the whole, on the majority, despite what many people think of MPs, um, there's you know, many perceptions um, of members of parliament, they do on the whole understand the issue um, of climate change and they do understand um, that it's important to act um, and they do understand that we need to do more. But what's lacking, um, and this is a default of the political system um, that we find ourselves in the UK, is that we have very short term election cycles. Um, climate change is often a low salience issue, which means that in comparison to other policy areas, so right now the pandemic, when Brexit, um, things like that, the NHS, people don't think that climate change should be the top focus. People don't see how climate change um, can be um, embedded within these other policy areas. Um, and because of that, they're not always writing to their MPs about climate change. Um, and that's despite the fact that they do think that climate change is a really important issue. They just think that the government should be getting on with it anyway. But because of the reality is 
the government aren't getting on with it, um, that means that, you know, what, what is happening? Um, and so Rebecca sort of looked at that question deeper and in the interviews with the MPs, um, it revealed more that not, they didn't just think that it was an issue, um, but they felt that they didn't have the confidence to act on the issue. And that was because um, of all the correspondence that members of parliament um, receive. So, you know, they get that. And like when I was creating the Making Climate Politics Easier program, I interviewed, um, and these are public, so I can say this, um, interviewed Matthew Pennycook, the Shadow Climate Change Minister for the Labour Party, um, I interviewed Olivia Blake, the recent um, MP that was elected for Sheffield Hallam, Nadia Whitholm, um, members of the Green Party, including Alexandra Phillips, um, people from the Liberal Democrats, people from all different parties, essentially, um, and all political persuasions. And they all said the same thing, which was that out of all the correspondence I get as an elected representative, the least amount I receive is on climate change. And so when I'm going to you know, shape my agenda, determine what my priorities need to be, that is not going to be the number one if the if the number of constituents that are writing about it to me on a constant basis isn't at the highest um, and so like i say in all of the correspondence that they receive which is thousands a week um in emails tweets whatever they could receive x amount on the pandemic x amount on brexit but if they don't receive things on climate change then you know that's not going to be um, what they act on and so rebecca basically to conclude um says that it's really important um the public you know, the public do continue um, to pressure um, the government um, in acting on climate change and showing them that, that, that it is a priority um, for the people um, so that the action that we need to, um, need to see will actually become a reality. Um, and one of the other things that's worth noting about Rebecca's work um, and something that I've found myself um, in, in interactions um, that I've had with members of parliament is that a, com a common theme is that um, members of parliament are most receptive to the least likely type of campaigner, which is something I mentioned earlier. And that's why as teachers, you might think, oh, what can I realistically do as a teacher or a soon to be teacher? What can my students realistically do? You should know your power. Like you have a lot of influence in determining um, like what can happen at a local level and what you can get your MP to do. Um, MPs love schools for one. They love um, working with young people and teachers. Um, and beyond that, um, you know, school community, involves parents, involves students, um, involves teachers, there's all these different types of people coming together. So it's not just young people um, out on the streets with placards, it's not just young people shouting at politicians, it's this, you know, creative, holistic approach that's being taken um, to climate lobbying. And that's really fulfilling what Rebecca um, has wrote about in her work, um, which has shown that um, that's, the most, that's the most effective type um, of climate lobbying that we can do and get involved in. And so you might have been thinking throughout all of that, why is this random guy from Hope for the Future telling me about climate change, telling me about MPs, telling me what an MP is, what an MP can do and why we need to talk to them? Because I don't even know who my MP is. Well, let me tell you, that is fine. Because if I didn't study politics, I'd have no clue who my MP was either. Every time I go home, my parents are like, I still don't know who my MP is. Um, so the easiest way to um, find out who your MP is, um, essentially is to just literally type in on Google, who is my MP? Um, and you'll get given the, the UK Parliament website, literally takes a minute. Um, you'll be provided with lots of different types of information. Um, so the political party that they're a member of, um, their email address um, and how to contact them in other, in other methods as well. Um, so what I would recommend you do, and I also remind you of this at the end, um, if I don't, someone please remind me to remind you, um, is find out who your MP is today um, and think about some of the things that we've just talked about um, and think about what you can do um, and how you can get involved um, in this more widely. But before we move on to the end and before we move on to anything else, what I'm going to do now is just quickly go through the relationship based approach, um, which is the approach that Hope for the Future um, essentially deploys, utilizes um, to ensure that the engagements that we have with elected representatives are effective. And the reason, um, like I said earlier, um, is, is that this, this approach was essentially created because. Um, in climate change, there has been, um, or in climate um, politics rather, there has been a lot of to and fro, there has been a lot of breakdown in discussions between those trying um, to ensure that climate action is a priority and those that have resisted. Um, and so we've created this approach which basically seeks to find common ground between people um, and seeks to win hearts and minds, um, not through facts and figures, but meaningful dialogue. Um, and it, it has got a proven and growing track record. I'll give you some of the um, case studies 
um, about that um, at the end. Um, and then we can sort of ask questions on it and that sort of thing. So the relationship based approach then um, is a five step approach to climate lobbying. Um, it involves research, it involves finding common ground, um, it, it involves defining a smart agenda, it involves offering rewards, and it involves preparing for the conversation. Now, this is going to be a snapshot, and um, this is going to be a very brief overview um, of this approach, and it's very, very detailed. So if there's anything else um, that you might be thinking, I don't quite understand that bit, then don't panic, because it is quite an extensive um, thing to understand um, and there's a lot more to it um, and there's usually like two um, one and a half hour sessions on this approach alone um, but do feel free to get in contact with Hope for the Future to find out more um, or we can arrange a school workshop in your school um, to, to, to expand our knowledge on this approach. So the first part then to really understand about this approach um, is that it's based in psychology, sociology, politics. Um, it's an interdisciplinary um, approach to climate comms um, and ensuring that you know we can really win hearts and minds um, and have effective conversations. And so our founding director, who's actually not our founding director, our director um, at the minute, Sarah Robinson, was a previous psychology student um, and she helped to develop this approach. Um, and basically um, what the approach is founded on is the, um, the idea that in our brains, we have a part of our brain, which is called the amygdala. Now this triggers our fight or flight response. Um, and what we found um, was that in these meetings with MPs, both on the side of the campaigners and on the side of the elected representative, the fight or flight response is being triggered when people were saying not the most positive um, of things basically to one another. Um, and this meant that, you know, we really, really need to look at how people are having these conversations, how democracy is working um, to ensure that the action we need actually becomes a reality, like we keep on saying. Um, and so what we found, what the, the amygdala psychology um, shows is that if you can create feelings of safety, well-being, um, then what that actually allows is for people to evolve. It allows for mindsets to change and it allows for people to move beyond um, what's familiar and safe to them. Um, but if you create fear, if you instill sort of um, insecurity towards people, um, then that can, you know, that creates their flight, that creates their um, sort of response that means that they want to remain locked um, in their old patterns, their old ways. And it leads to, like I say, the breakdown um, of, of communications and the prevention of any action actually happening. Um, and so that's what we really need to think about here, that this approach is very, very much about, um, and you know, you, you could arguably say that um, it's a bit rosy um, at times, um, but what I think the benefit of this approach, approach is, is that it allows us to work within um, the parliamentary arithmetic that we have at the minute, which is a conservative majority. Um, and it means that we are able to work with people that we might not always agree with. And if you're a conservative and you don't agree with Labour, then it means that you can work with them um, equally. And if you've got Lib Dem, SNP, the same applies. Um, and so that's what it's all about. It's about creating feelings of well-being, trust, um, and finding that common ground. So it starts a little bit like this. Step one, research. Now we use this quote by Ken Hamer at Hope for the Future, which is designing a presentation without an audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern. And now I'm not telling you to write love letters to your MPs because that'd be a bit weird. Um, and I'm not telling you um, to write love letters to anyone actually. Um, but what I'm telling you to do is that what's really important when we begin thinking about how we're going to communicate to anyone, um, but specifically members of parliament, is that we really need to understand who they are, what do they stand for, what are their hopes, fears and dreams, and how can we speak to them? So for example, if you're an ardent Labour supporter um, and your Member of Parliament is a Conservative, um, then it's probably no good starting the conversation with, I hate the Conservatives <laughs> because, you know, that's not going to, they're just going to think, right, well, I'm a bit stuck here then, aren't I? And equally, if you're an ardent Conservative supporter and your Member of Parliament is a Labour MP, it's no good starting, I don't like the Labour Party because, you know, it just, it creates this breakdown. And I'm not saying that any of you would say that, but I have seen people say that, so I'm just creating that point there. Um, and so what it really also entails is understanding who they are as an MP and what type of MP they are, for which there are many. Um, so thinking about are they a backbench MP, are they on the opposition benches, are they in government, um, how long have they been an MP, what type of constituency do they represent, um, why they got involved in politics, 
um, all these types of things um, that you really need to know to understand who they are as a person to ensure that the message um, that you construct is going to be framed specifically to them because you know there's there's nothing there's nothing better than a tailored message um, in terms of you becoming receptive towards it. And all, we as an organization create tailored lobbying strategies which can really, really help uh, with the research behind who an MP is um, and what type of background they have and what type of message might work for them. Um, and there's lots of other types of channels that you can find out um, more information about your MP, including social media, Hansard, um, websites such as they work for you, um, that sort of thing, which will allow you to create a profile, if you will, um, of who this MP is, what they care about, um, what they don't really care about and how you can work with them um, to, to create action and create change. And like I said, there's a lot, lot more detail to research, and, but we don't really have the time to do that um, in today's session. So we can um, fill in gaps later, later and afterwards. Um, and then the next step is finding common ground, which in this political climate, you might think I'm crazy for saying this, um, but let me tell you, it is very easy to find common ground um, even in the smallest of places. Um, and it's all about really, you know, working step by step, thinking about the small changes um, that we can do, uh, which will hopefully then lead on to bigger changes. And so the way that we do this is we use this Venn diagram. Um, and what we do is in one section, we put our MPs agenda. So for example, it might be an MP that's avoiding action on climate change. Um, they might be visibly acting though on local issues concerning local people and you might be concerned about low, um, levels of youth employment. Um, in your agenda then, um, just as an example, um, hopefully this is your agenda, and um, while well, some of it reflects some of your agenda, um, is tackling climate change, challenging government policy, raising awareness of climate change, um, and empowering MPs to take action. And so, example of common ground um, as a result of them to agendas then, would be perhaps you know your MP is concerned about levels of employment. Well, you want to tackle climate change. Hello, green jobs. Let's think about that. Let's try and work out something that we can do um, on green jobs, green education as well. If they're um, if they're concerned um, about levels of employment, you're concerned about um, tackling climate change. How do we prepare people for green jobs? Well, it obviously begins with education, um, and so them two things already could emerge from that and really centering then that message around your MPs um, concerns about local people um, is, is going to be a really, really important thing to do here um, because it's going to make them much more receptive um, to the things um, that you have to say. Thinking back to what is the primary role of an MP to represent the people that elected them, their constituents. So if you're framing this um, through a constituency lens, then your MP is going to be like ticking the box um, let's get moving with this. Let's get something done because you know I want to support my constituents. Um, and if that if green jobs and green education in my constituency is going to help, um, then then let's get working with this. So some of the things that you might want to ask them then, and this will really depend um, on the type of relationship you have with your MP. So for example, there's probably not much use um, asking an MP that you've met for the first time um, that's never spoke about. Um, the issue that you're wanting to lobby them about to go and write an article in the local media. I mean, great if it happens, um, and sometimes it does, uh, but it's really important to think about taking the steps that you need to build a relationship with the person that you're trying to influence. So something that you might want to consider doing first um, is writing, asking them to write to a minister on your behalf about a topic. And once they've done that, you know, in a week's time, follow up, say, oh, that was great. Once you've got the response, create that dialogue again um, and then keep it moving. You know, it might lead to an event on green jobs where they sit on a panel um, and engage with experts and constituents um, about green jobs in their constituency. And then after that, they might publish an article um, in, a, in the local media um, about green jobs um, in the local area. So they're the types of things um, that you might want to consider and the types of timelines um, that you might want to think about following. Um, and then keeping it smart, um, so you will have heard about Keep It Smart before, um, probably. Um, and basically it's just specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. So like I said earlier, one of the really key things is that you need to know what you wanna ask your MP um, because there's nothing worse than an MP receiving an email saying, please tackle climate change. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean um, you know, investing in renewable energy? Does that mean um, creating green education? 
but you know we've got to be specific here and i think that a really good platform and um, a really good angle for teachers to take is of course um you know budgets for teachers to really implement the types of things in schools and um, such as increased support for young people and teachers that are suffering from eco-anxiety um increased workshops um for climate change increased funding um for um for delivery of climate change lessons, that sort of thing, um, or solar panels on schools, for example. So keeping it specific and keeping it um, measurable um, is a really good place to start because, you know, if you say, for instance, I want you to write to a minister, would not I want, but it would be great if you could write to a minister um, about green education. That's a specific ask and something that you can measure because you can say, have they done it or have they not? Um, and achievable, I'd like you to do that sort of immediately after this meeting. Um, you know that's achievable and um, it's also realistic um, and it's got a time frame and a timestamp attached to it so you can see then how really honing in your ask um, is a really good way to ensure that the engagement you have is effective and hope for the future as an organization can really help um, to sort of develop um, and refine these smart asks um, and then something else that we always advise um, sort of including in your engagements um, is offering rewards. Now, this might sound a bit House of Cardsy, and um, for those of you that have watched House of Cards, a bit cynical and um, towards politicians. Um, but it doesn't. It's not. It's not all cynical. Um, but if you can sort of say, you know, the MP. So, for example, um, something that like I never really knew before I started working at Hope for the Future is actually how much MPs have to know about things and how many subjects um, they go through um, a single day. So for example, they might have um, meetings with constituents on a Friday, then meetings could look a little something like, right, 30 minutes on Brexit, 30 minutes on the NHS, now we're back to Brexit, then we're gonna talk about climate change, then we're on education, back to climate change, then it's defense spending, then it's foreign policy. And there's all these topics that they have to know about all the time that actually, and given the fact that you're all teachers, you probably know more about education and about, well, definitely about education, and more about climate change than the MPs that you're talking to. Um, and so, you know, providing an educational experience for them is going to be really beneficial in that they're going to have that improved knowledge and understanding. Um, and it's going to empower them with the knowledge to think about this issue more. If you can communicate that in your correspondence, then that's great. Um, and again, constituency mandates. So thinking back um, to the, the um, primary role of MPs, which is all about, um, you know, representing the people that elected them um, and communicating that directly um, in your sort of correspondence. So if you can say that, you know, come to this event, there'll be all these constituents here uh, who are going to demonstrate to you that climate action is really important, then they're, they're going to be very, very willing to want to go going along because of the next point, it can create good publicity um, and that sort of thing. Um, and then also finally, this is a really important one, is that so actually, I'll, I'll just add to this before I make the point, is that I'm currently um, in my third year of uni, so I've just done a placement year at Hope for the Future. Um, so I'm writing my dissertation now actually all about how MPs um, and how COVID-19 essentially has changed the landscape um, for the confidence of MPs in acting on climate change. Um, and one of the things that I've come across in my reading is that um, MPs go into politics because they've got a sense for um, public service um, and because they do they might not always agree with what you agree with they do want to make people's lives better um, and that's obviously subject to their own sort of views and understandings of the world how they make that life and um, that world better but if you can communicate that acting on the climate um, crisis is going to leave a legacy where you have made positive impacts to people then you know that is going to be a good sell um, to, to MPs um, and it's going to really make them hopefully want to act um, and so these are the sorts of things um, then that, is, that are always good um, to keep in mind offering rewards. Um, so let's look at some case studies then. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is Olivia Blake really quickly, which will just demonstrate um, the proven track record that this has. Now, Olivia Blake is somebody um, that was elected in my um, previous constituency. Um, I currently live in Sheffield Central. Um, she was elected to represent Sheffield Hallam um, back in 2019. Um, and Hallam is arguably a marginal seat. Um, her majority is about 500 votes um, and she didn't, um, she had quite a tough fight in that the Lib Dems um, were very close um, and the previous MP um, wasn't, um, didn't have the best reputation <laughs> um, to put it one way. Um, and so Olivia Blake then, um, we 
And um, what we did during the election was we organised uh, climate hustings with young people um, at a local school called King Egbert. Um, and that really allowed all the parliamentary candidates to give their points of view um, on the climate crisis to young people. And it allowed young people to really engage um, with um, their, their prospective parliamentary candidates um, on what their plans were to tackle the climate emergency. Um, and then following Olivia's election, um, we engaged her in one of our other projects called Parents for the Future or Families for the Future, um, which is all about um, helping young parents um, and older parents um, work with their MPs um, in the hope that, you know, they can create this angle um, of, you know, we need to take climate action um, to really help um, secure the future of our young children and secure um, the current future um, for young children now. Um, and then we followed this up um, with a further workshop, um, school workshop um, with Olivia Blake during the pandemic, um, which was an online virtual workshop, which the majority of our workshops have been um, over the past 12 months. Um, and what this really um, meant was that we was constantly, constantly um, working with Olivia Blake. We have been for the past year um, through many different types of um, engagements, engaging her with many different types of constituents. Um, and this really allowed Olivia to understand um, that, you know, there is a widespread support for climate action in Sheffield Hallam. And it's really, really important that I act. Um, and obviously, Hope for the Future is by no means um, the vehicle for why this happened. Um, but it did definitely contribute um, to the amazing track record that Olivia Blake has now on climate change um, and the passion that she shows as an MP um, and the representation that she provides for her constituents um, really, really, um, you know, is, is, is shown by the fact that people are continuously telling Olivia Blake that climate change is something um, that's important. Um, and so the, the case study here then is that that's how um, communicating climate change in a positive way and creating this dialogue um, can have that impact. And then the second case study um, is with Nigel Evans MP, who is the MP for the River Valley, um, which is my MP back home. And I recently writ this, um, well, with um, one of my colleagues um, for a report that we were writing. Um, so I think it's like, it's gonna sound a bit weird in that I'm gonna say my own name, um, but if, yeah, if you just like bear with, um, this is a case study that we wrote um, about Nigel Evans. Um, so I'll just get it up. While Robbie's doing that, um, please put your questions in uh, in the chat because we will have five minutes to pick some of these questions up. We've already got two good um, questions there. So please add to the chat if you've got any questions. Absolutely. So the case study here then is that back in early 2019, our current schools and youth outreach officer, Robbie, participated in the previous version of making climate politics easier, then known as the student training programme. After practicing Hope for the Future's approach to climate lobbying and communications, Robbie was able to find common ground with his MP, Nigel Evans, and encouraged him to take action within Parliament. As a politics and sociology student at the University of Sheffield, he was studying contemporary security challenges and used this area of interest to engage Nigel, who at the time sat on the International Development Committee. As a result of Robbie and Nigel's meeting, Nigel submitted several written questions to the government on topics including extreme weather patterns and international climate change. Robbie also extended an invitation for Nigel to attend a Hope for the Future School workshop, which he led at his former high school, St Cecilia's. The workshop was a great success. Nigel met with Blanchard's first UN accredited climate change teacher, Robbie's former, former geography and form tutor, and engaged with students on a number of issues, including net zero, re renewable energy and battery technology. Significantly, following the workshop, Nigel wrote to Robbie expressing how pleased he was that the Prime Minister had vowed to ensure the transition to net zero happens. Further, once re-elected as MP in the 2017 general election, Nigel vowed to champion the concerns of young people in the River Valley, including on climate change, something Robbie and other young people in the constituency had asked him to do. So again, that just basically shows that through ongoing engagement and through communicating climate change in a positive way um, and finding common ground with people that you don't always agree with, um, I certainly do not agree with Nigel Evans um, on everything, um, but you know, by, by finding this common ground, um, you are able to, to create these small actions which will hopefully um, lead um, to, to, to meaningful climate action. Um, and so, yeah, it just basically um, demonstrates the effectiveness of our approach um, and shows that, you know, strong relationships can lead to hearts and minds being won um, and MPs can then obtain the confidence to act on the climate emergency. So last thing I will say is that um, 
if you want to get involved today, um, then contact me um, and we can look at creating um, some form of workshop for the students that you work with um, in your schools or that you might work with in the future. And you can definitely ask me more questions um, about the, some of the things that I've mentioned. I promise it won't just be one big ramble. It'll be much more of a two way dialogue. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are like, oh, I feel like I've just sat in a lecture. Um, but also I hope that it was um, useful. Um, and then the second thing that I would say is that do check out the Future Generations Bill. Um, it's something that's going through um, Parliament at the minute. Um, it's been sponsored by Caroline Lucas um, and John Bird in the House of Lords. Um, and it's all about ensuring that decision making prevents future pandemics and protects us against the climate emergency um, and safeguards um, the future for generations that are yet to be born, but also addresses real time, real life inequalities now. Um, and it's something that we've um, been encouraging people to, to, to write to their MPs about because it's, it, it really is like quite a pertinent um, thing. So yeah, thank you uh, so much. Please do email me, my, uh, my email is robbie at hfcf.org.uk. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, then yeah, ask them away. I'll stop sharing my screen as well. Uh, thank you very much, Robbie. That was really, really good because it gave us a really thorough um, uh, summary of what your work involves. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, it's always good to ask them verbally. So the first question from the Socialist Educational Association, would you like to ask your question verbally to Robbie? Yeah, yeah, it's just about, um, uh, about local issues because um, I think the, the the huge macro issue of climate change is, is you know you've given some examples of how it can be how one can engage with it but uh, for local people and for school children as well actually the you know the pollution on the street I mean I'm I'm sitting here in London but we've had that case of the girl who who, who died of an asthma attack because of traffic on the street etc those kind of issues are something you can really build traction on with an M with MPs and then you can bring in the kind of national or bigger macro picture in starting with that small issue which could be very important to local people and to MPs isn't that a way of getting people motivated is the question I suppose no yeah absolutely um, and so one of the points um, which I hopefully um, tried to communicate later on in the session um, was that you know really understanding who your MP is and what constituency they represent and um, is a really good way to, to like you say begin so if there is um examples of traffic pollution, um, cycling um, improvements that need to be done, then that is literally such good, a such good way um, of really starting, um, starting them conversations. In Sheffield, for example, um, you probably might have heard of the trees, um, quite a contentious um, subject. Um, so that is a really good example of how local people can create local change that brings national attention to an issue. Um, so if you can demonstrate to your local member of parliament um, that these these things that are happening locally and um, that you want to you know take forward um, then yeah absolutely do that I think that that's a brilliant idea um, and like I said um, earlier one of the really good things also that could happen um, from that is some of the things that you've mentioned there um, are also to do with local councils so you talking to your MP um, about some of these issues um, and saying you know these are the things that um, matter to local people your MP can then go on to raise them nationally and also to the local council and really combining um, them, them local and national climate um, prevention strategies. Um, so yeah, that's that's really good. And yeah, if you know any young people, know any teachers um, that need support and help um, and want to work with their local and national politicians, then hit me up um, and we can we can get something moving. Thanks, Bobby, for that. There's another question from Chris as well, because obviously one of the focuses for this conference today is how can we empower our pupils in our classrooms to do that climate lobbying and, and find confident voices. So Chris's question revolves around that, doesn't it, Chris? Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. I mean, it follows on very well from the first one in terms of the, the local community aspect, but it's about empowerment of pupils and how can we develop a, a, an education system, a school's education system, that actually encourages greater agency, develops knowledge and understanding within those sort of areas around climate change, but also gives people, th you know, thinking about the values, the humanity, uh, the compassion to actually understand not only people in the local community, but globally. Um, and I'm working with some schools on, the, on a project at the moment, looking at uh, empowerment. And I just think, are there any ideas that you've got, any suggestions you've got for developing that? Yeah, so um, in my capacity, not as a Hope for the Future member of staff, but in my capacity um, as a Teach the Future advisory 
um, board member. I would say that um, the curriculum just generally needs to be greener um, and that there needs to be improved budgets and um, capacity for teachers to really implement a greener curriculum. Um, and that, you know, tackling climate change and reaching net zero cannot happen if the curriculum doesn't prepare young people to do that. Um, but I think that in terms of like um, what we can do more practically um, without big changes, um, so at Hope for the Future, for example, we offer free free workshops to schools um, that, you know, we come in, we get young people sort of um, angry is the wrong word, but impassioned um, about issues and provide them in real time with the sort of skills that they need um, to effectively communicate with their decision makers um, in that, you know, they can then go form campaigns, for example, in the workshops and um, think about ideas that involve um, sustainability and environmental issues um, and then will facilitate the communication of them um, student and teacher ideas to um, a politician locally or nationally. Um, and I think that that's, that's quite a practical way of how you can you know, do something um, that is going to be meaningful um, for the community, for the students um, and for teachers as well. Because, you know, not only are you going to hopefully create um, a more climate friendly community um, you're going to provide students and teachers um, with, you know, the beginning of that passion that is hopefully going to lead elsewhere um, and hopefully going to lead to, to change further down the line. Um, but, yeah, I think. That, that's probably like the main thing that I would say um, in terms of what I can think of right now. Um, but also just another couple of ideas. I don't know if they're quite what you're looking for, but just doing more like creative things. I think creative things are like a great way to stimulate minds um, and a great way to get people thinking about issues differently. And um, so one of the things that we do at Hope for the Future um, is the My Hope for the Future art competition. So I'm asking a student that, so for example, me, I come from a working class background, I'm born on a council estate in Preston, my parents, do not really care about climate change. It's not their concern. They're bothered about paying the bills. They're bothered about, um, you know, ensuring that we've got food on the table when we were growing up. So environmental issues were not their concern. But if you can get um, a, a young person from that type of background and say, right, let's imagine a different world. Let's imagine a world where everybody has got equal access to green spaces, where everybody can use public transport, where everybody, um, you know, has, has got a better life essentially and if you can do that creatively then that's going to spark a much much bigger um imagination and it's going to allow them to observe and investigate issues um, in a less conventional way um, so i think that you know creativeness is such a such a good way and um, to do it and if i was at school and we did something like that that would have benefited me massively um, so i think yeah hope for the future workshop hope for the future art competition um, and happy to chat about any other ideas in the future hopefully that helps Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm going to actually end it now because I want you all to have at least a five minute break before the next keynote. So thank you very much, Robbie. You've given us lots of food for thought. Thanks everyone for attending the workshop. Have a good great. break. I'll see you in the keynote.